The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Happy Easter, Wolfpack! After getting numerous and numerous requests to do a Goosebumps Easter special, I've begrudgingly given in since I have nothing better to do. And, oh wait, will you get out here already? No, but I don't wanna! I'm scared! We're returning to g g g g g g g g goosebumps time! <laughs> True, but this time, we're analyzing a wacky comedy episode! I know I've stated this in a ton of my old videos, but I'll say it again. Horror anthologies are almost always guaranteed to suck at telling goofy, dark comedies. While horror shows mainly deliver on decent nightmares and fantastical concepts, the writers who are talented at scaring us are usually unaware on how to create funny hijinks because most of the time, I've seen a horror comedy, it has been bomb after bomb after bomb. Sometimes we do get a good one once in a blue moon, but R.L. Stein's writing team have never been admired for their intentional silly comedy tales. They tend to suck because they're so corny, so cheesy, and painfully unfunny. But we have yet to really look at Goosebumps' spin at zany comedy episodes, so why not start with one of the most infamous? Oh, well, if it's a comedy, then I'm in! Hi, Wolf Cubs! I'm Scaredy Cat, the bravest feline among the kitty litter! At least my mommy says so. I'm here with Catastrophe to study how not to do comedy. Well, you couldn't have gone with a better choice because I'm not funny. <laughs> Today's story is also not very funny because the jokes are stale, the acting is crap, the plot fails, and even the children who worship this show totally wrote off this episode as old hat. I have heard some fans defend it, but they didn't exactly praise it as best episode material either. If that doesn't say a lot, well, Goosebumps fans are also perplexed by the book, branding it as one of the weakest novels in the carrot patch. Not only was it the most unscary literature from the franchise, but the comedy was hit and miss, the characters stunk like cabbage, and even Stein's epic creativity hit an all-time low with this mess. I'll say, even I'm not afraid of the angry bunny on the cover. He looks constipated. <laughs> well, I've sat through some of the worst horror comedies back on The Haunting Hour. Near Mint Condition, Bad Egg, Poop de Fromage, Stage Fright. All sucked, but this is Goosebumps after all, so how bad can it possibly be? I'm not afraid. You will be. You will be. So, oh, that scary Muppet might be right. Let's just go back to My Little Pony. No, it's Easter and we're smearing this special egg all over everyone's faces. Was Bad Hair Day truly worthy of being one of the worst episodes of the series, or is it really a golden egg hatched underneath the nest of obscurity? Nope. Too bad. We're cracking it open anyway. This is our Wacky Easter review on the Wacky Goosebumps comedy, Bad Hair Day. <laughs> So, our episode opens up with two kids walking down the street, where they discuss today's gimmick, magic. Oh, come on, Tim, that trick is so old. Come on, just think a card. I need you to think a card. What you need is some new tricks like a mazel. Yeah, but they're so expensive. If you had some of his tricks, you could be the great Timothy. Look, sir, droids. And we have awful child acting. Off to a fan-frickin-tastic start, aren't we? 
One of the worst aspects about this episode is that the child acting is so terrible that it kind of soils on the jokes. I mean, how can you tell funny zingers when your stars are bad at conveying them? 250, really? 250, Brainzo. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer. Yeah, crappy child acting is at an all-time high this round, Wolfpack. It's painful. But we're stuck with our main man here, Tim Swanson, played by one of Kumar's weed dealers. Huh. Everything is really falling into place now. Tim Swanson, like his book counterpart, is a total moron who screws up a lot. But he has a fascination with magic, aspiring to become a great magician like his hero, Amazo, the Sorcerer Supreme of the Goosebumps universe. Wow, sounds like your life sucks. That guy who fought the Justice League? <laughs> No, silly scaredy cat. Professor Ivo's upgraded to a new model now. But now you will fall to my new android, Extremo! Tim dreams of being a big-named magician one day, but his annoying, stereotypical black best friend shuts him down by pointing out how he first needs the best gadgets money could buy. Yeah, I know this kid has a name, but be honest, you don't remember it. This kid is only the cliched black best friend, and he serves no further role like his book counterpart did. All he is, is the jive black broski. I am the token black guy. I'm just supposed to smile, stay out of the conversation, and say things like, damn, shit. And that is whack! They're shopping at an Amazo-approved magic shop, where they never buy anything from the eccentric shopkeeper, Bowser. No, really. This old guy is King Bowser, from the radical cartoon show, Super Mario Bros. And how come we're hanging out in this garbage can? Cause I got a great plan, it's called Operation Smell Like Shit. Wowzers! That's actually a cool cameo! This is the closest we'll ever get to a Goosebumps Nintendo crossover! Bowser is pretty chill and down with the kids and such, unlike stupid Sardo. Smell like shit! As he shows off his wicked magic merch. His personal favorite being the mini guillotine trick which he just has to show off to the witless wonders. Now, I just can't quite reach with my hand, so if you could just move that lever over there, that'll lock the blade in place. No, not that one! <laughs> What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Oh, he's fine. <laughs> Easily the funniest joke of the whole episode. <laughs> Fun fact, some areas actually censor out this bit where Bowser pretends he got his hand sliced off. Likely cause it's pretty grim, but honestly, that's what makes it all the more better. This is the only great joke in the story. It seriously never gets higher than this. First you guys remove the child abduction ring on attack of the jack-o'-lanterns, now you try to remove the fake out hand cut off trick? Man, grow some thicker scales. But Bowser rewards the heroes for not pissing themselves in fear with some free tickets to the Amazo show. But oh no, the show is on a school night. What'll they do? I guess that's the end. No, of course he tries sneaking out at night, but somebody crosses his path. I'm going out to the garage to practice a new trick. Oh, really? Ugh. This is Ginny, 
Tim's bratty little bitchy bitch sister, who will be the most detestable character in the whole story. I know R.L. Stein loves writing his bratty slash idiot bully sibling characters, but she is one of the worst. She just piles aggravating onto the boredom. In fact, this lady was also Seth Gold's bratty kid sister on Click, so she knows how to annoy. Boy, does she ever. I'm gonna tell. This amazo guy better be good. Whatever. Mom! Shut up! Ginny sucks. She sucks noodles. And sadly, she brings the story down by a lot because she's so maddening. And just in case that doesn't piss you off, well, she blackmails her bro Tim into taking her out to a Mazo show. Effectively removing the token black guy out of the plot forever. Alright, I won't. <sighs> if you take me with you. What a... Bitch. We cut to the Magic Mansion as Amazo entertains his fans of like 15 people, though with a few admittedly pretty cool magic tricks. <laughs> Wowzers! That was awesome! Whenever the episode actually has magic, the show is quite terrific at making it thrilling! I know, right? Magic is so cool! I only wish the comedy could equally amaze, too. What's the matter, buddy? Having a bad hair day? <laughs> 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 Lame! And just like in the book, Amazo needs a volunteer for his special new trick. His Captain Crazy Clown Box trick. And of course, he chooses... Me? Yes, Scaredy, like in the book he picks you. Really? No! <gasps> Tim is summoned to finally live his dream of performing alongside his hero. What? Tim enters the magic box as Amazo continues to fail at his stand-up routine. Oh, by the way, if you meet a red-headed boy with a Hawaiian shirt, tell him he got an A in science class and his cat had kittens. <laughs> <laughs> but if he says I touched him, he's a liar. So Amazo pulls off his Captain Crazy trick by dumping Tim in his creepy pedo basement. But uh-oh, he accidentally stays locked in there, missing his show. <laughs> um, should we be worried that a young boy was taken and locked in a weird sex dungeon looking dump? <sighs> no, Amazo's not going to abuse him. He's just going to neglect him, since Tim is stuck in here the whole night. Yep. Tim misses out on his hero because nobody lets him out until the showcase wraps up. While he bums around for a century, I just want to point out that this is the halfway point of the story. I was going to say, does anything cool or scary happen in this at all? Half this plot is the kids getting to the dang magic show. Then, Tim missing the magic show. Nothing all that creepy happens, except for a fake out and maybe the kid getting locked up in the basement would be scary. But Tim is not afraid of this, so the audience isn't either. I know, right? This episode is so simple that it gets real boring real fast. I mean, see this scene of Tim just sitting around in the basement, bored out of his mind and waiting for something exciting to happen, only to miss out on all the magical wonder off screen? This is the perfect metaphor for this episode. We are Tim, and Amazo's off-screen show is all the wasted potential of this story. Nothing fun ever occurs in this adventure, and as a result, it all feels mega dull and slow. I want to see some fantabulous magic goosebumps, yet we're wasting all this time on pitiful build-up and cringe comedy. It's uber lame. And trust me, this episode doesn't exactly go uphill from here.
But look on the plus side. Guess who shows up? On tonight's show, where's the fire, buddy? Kalamaki. What? Oh my gosh, it's comedy legend Colin Mockery! Yeah! That's right, Wolfpack. Goosebumps seriously got famous comedian Colin Mockery to appear on their silly horror series. Goosebumps recruited Colin Mockery for a dark fantasy tale. <laughs> Suck on that, Wayne Brady. This guy is a platinum-level comedy genius who has entertained billions of people, especially on his popular show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Currently available on The CW. This guy is so funny that he's better than R.L. Stein getting Christopher Lloyd, Margot Kidder, Adam West, and even Tom Kenny combined. He is that hilarious. Holy mother of pearl, this is going to be great. What does he do? Hey, kid. The exit's down that way. Well, that was pointless. Uh, cat? <gasps> Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard. That was it? What a load of hogwash. You got Colin Mockery for a pathetic wannabe Stan Lee cameo? Well, actually, Colin Mockery does have a larger part in this, but we'll get to that point later. For now, this was an obvious trailer moment. Oh, kind of like Darth Ray, except with talent. Tim searches for an exit, but what's this? He stumbles upon a Mezo's dressing room, where he attempts to meet his hero. But then we get this very odd scene. Basically, Tim overhears a Mezo being a dick towards him, but it's so poorly staged that it's hard to tell if he's even talking to Tim or if he's even in the same room as him. It's a tad confusing. They left me locked up in that room for the Come whole... Here. You know how many kids would give their right arm to be in my show? Now get out of here, you little brat. Are you calling me a, a brat? What's the matter, you devil? We're just stupid. Beat it. Yeah, Amazo is clearly not in the same room with you, and his voice is far off in the distance that it doesn't even sound like he's addressing our main man. But Tim stupidly thinks his hero is a jerk insulting him. So, is Tim a moron? Because he's clearly alone in that empty room, and the camera shows us it's only him in there. In fact, I can barely even hear Amazo's voiceover since he's too far off to make out. It's so sloppy. Well, tell you what. I'm going to take this scene here and bring it up again later. Because guess what? It's never properly explained until we get to the twist. Always irked me as a kitten. But on its own, the scene is not played out all that well, and it's obviously a fake-out to make Amazo seem like a prick, when even the kids at home can see he's not there. You nerd! So, our hero Tim steals Amazo's magic kit to get back at him, because stealing makes you stronger. What a role model! What the heck was that? I know it's supposed to be a jump scare, but why does the sister sound like she's malfunctioning? It's just so hilarious. Her animatronic acting is breaking down. Well, here's hoping the rabies-infected sister makes the meme generator. The sister meets up with Tim, where she helps him steal the magic kit, so she can play with it too. Nothing but noble heroes all around for you kids. <laughs> the next day, they play with Amazo's magic kit, where naturally, wacky antics resume. <laughs> What was that? He booby-trapped it. 
I think it's a computer chip or something. So, after surviving the magic security, they look through all the toy shop crap, just like in the book. And even I won't deny that this was the heaviest filler in the novel. They essentially screwed around with everything, and I mean every little magic item from Amazo's inventory. Though oddly, the TV version trims it down, to the point where half the cool magic gizmos were eliminated. While I understand shaving off the fluff, it took away some of the good magic. They only have the garbage leftovers. It's in need instructions. Ah! It's... it's fake. But look at it though. It's so real. Um, no. The stupid CGI snakes from Jake the Snake look more lifelike. Even worse, they removed the ball and the cup trick from the book! Why, showrunners? How could you rob kids of the whimsy of a ball in a cup? Ball in a cup, ball in a cup, it's a ball in a cup, ball in a cup, ball in a cup. But, oh no, the idiot sister accidentally makes herself disappear, leaving only a rabbit in her place. And this is where we stop following the book completely. In the original, the sister doesn't vanish, but instead transforms herself into the bunny rabbit after munching on a magic carrot. With the rest of the plot being Tim tracking down Amazo to change his sister back into a human. However, in the show, the sister has really gone into the shadow realm, and replacing her is... Ugh... Our main villain. Jimmy, if it's you, give me a sign. You want a sign? Go to the corner. It says stop. <laughs> oh. Where? Behind the rabbit? No, fool. He is the rabbit. <laughs> It's not scary, that's silly. And it's not even a funny silly. More of a, are you cereal silly? Hey, you better beware rabbits. They can get intense. <laughs> but on a fun side note, the bad hair is voiced by Colin Mockery. Yeah, about time we let the rabbit out of the hat. Colin Mockery does the voice acting for this magic talking hare, who is really a magician himself, who was hexed by Amazo to remain stuck in this form for all eternity. A once great sorcerer dubbed L. Sidney, wizard extraordinaire. L. Sidney? So in Spanish, his name translates to the Sydney. I see the bunny took inspiration from Homer Simpson. Well, if Bart can be El Barto. Oh, if only I had your courage, senor. Oh, <laughs> There was never an El Sydney in the book. He was devised specifically for the TV show. Most likely as a way to utilize Colin Mockery some more, since he's the main source of comic relief in this story arc. I suppose now's a good time as any to discuss our silly rabbit and his tricks for kids. L. Sidney tells Tim that he was once a fanboy of Amazo who wanted to be a great wizard just like him, despite the fact that he clearly sounds 50 and changes his backstory every few seconds. But Tim is a Bosch tet. L. Sidney claims that he worked with Amazo until one day his hero betrayed him in order to steal his magic, and he cursed him into becoming his pet Wabbit to pull out for cheap tricks. However, while trapped in the magic dimension, L. Sidney has been secretly planning his... Revenge! <laughs> And, lo and behold, a child chanced upon his prison, giving him the perfect opportunity to help them both get back at that evil Amazo. And if you guess that this too-good-to-be-true magic bunny with a satanic voice was really the twist villain, well then, congratulations! You're not a kindergartner!
Even I can tell this hair is bad news, since the show does a horrible job at hiding it. Aside from Colin Mockery's cartoony demon voice, the bunny claims he's been a fan of Amazo since he was a kid, yet in the same monologue states that he practically invented old school magic tricks ahead of Amazo's time. So, which is it? Were you a kid transformed, or an older magician who schooled Amazo? While it's possible he was turned into this hair as a kid and grew up in the life of a bunny, Amazo doesn't appear that old. It really reeks of the idea that this twist villain was last minute to throw off the book nerds. Now, I honestly view El Sydney as a love him or hate him character. I do think some of his jokes are quite funny. Nothing like on a Who's line, but every once in a while, Colin can deliver a cutesy quip. I get that a ton of folks hate him, since Goosebumps comedies are so child-friendly that they hurt, but I do find some of Mockery's lines humorous. His jokes are not that bad. No, what is bad are these obnoxiously overused wacky sound effects and background music which play all throughout the episode. I swear, every time this bunny cracks a joke, it is ruined by the irritating sound effects. Sydney, then... Hell, Sydney. And if that wasn't enough, he turned me into a weapon. And now you're making me twitch. Nobody's laughing! I absolutely despise the stupid, stupid comedy music. It makes an already unfunny episode even harder to enjoy. Even when Colin's trying to deliver a line, the music is cranked up so high that it's almost hard to make out everything he's saying. When I was a kitten, I could barely hear El Sydney's exposition and one-liners because the music almost tunes him out. You know how long I've been a rabbit? The humiliation I've endured? I met Amazo when I was just a young boy. Starting out in the world of magic, he was my hero. Mine too! Before you know it, I was on my way to being a star. Then one night, I run into Amazo. I had this magic wand I wanted to show him. Amazo went nuts! He stole the wand. In fact, he stole my entire act. And if that wasn't enough, he turned me into a weapon! <laughs> Why is the music from the world's smallest violin so loud? It's not even funny, it's just annoying. It nearly eclipses the voice dub because it's so in your face. Well, let me tell you how that makes me feel. You see? <laughs> cheesy sound effects in the back only feels like a discount laugh track, which honestly makes this episode much more embarrassing to sit through because the show has to tell you when it's meant to be funny. Thanks to the humor being meh, it only makes it dumber. The silly rabbit can be entertaining at times, but the episode simply fails at supporting him, and the story overall is not memorable. If you figured out the rabbit is evil all along, well the twist is not going to be a big whammy like the show intended. I don't think he's the worst comedy villain, like Alice Claiborne or the Doctor from I'm Not Martin, but his jokes are just cheesy, and his story doesn't take us on a wild ride, so you won't ever remember him. I legit want to love El Sydney, however, the plot rushes everything along now because of all the time we lost. Bless your soul, Colin, but you're only trying to save a sinking ship. Such a wasted baddie. But it was wasted! Wasted on all of you! But, back in the plot, the hare promises Tim that if he helps him gain his vengeance on Amazo, then he can save his jerk sister if they steal the magic wand. Yep, the whole conflict of the episode revolves around our characters rescuing the bratty sister. <laughs> problem with superheroes. They're too heroic. So they rather easily break into the magic mansion, just like in the book. What? No cartoon sound effects protecting it like the bag? 
And they go through Amazo's Magic Wand collection to find the real Olivelander material. And I will admit, this was a nice gag. What's it look like? Duh. How about black about two feet long with white tips and try to cover it? That's just wonderful. Okay, that was funny. The show can pull off some real good bits when they try. So, no kidding, Tim goes through hours of magic wands until he finds the real one. Yes, they spend hours in this place playing with each and every wand and somehow nobody finds them. Oh shit! But voila, the boys find the real one, which he uses to save his kid sister. Alakazam! Alakazar! Jenny, come back from wherever you are! Please! Ah! I'm telling Mom! Throw her back in! <laughs> So, after dumping his sister in hell, El Sidney tells him that he did it. Tim is a real magician after all. And that together, they can rule the magic galaxy. But only if he changes his mentor back into a human once more. So, of course he does, with zero questions asked. Oh! Tim is so stupid. Are we meant to like him? Because I kind of don't. I'm more irked at worse stuff because Colin's last hair joke is also his worst. Hey, watch it. That's my lucky foot. Eh, what's up, Dak? As the bunny changes in the box, what do you know, Amazo comes by. For some reason not questioning why there's a child in his stage at midnight. And he tells Tim he's sorry he never got the chance to meet with him. Revealing that Amazo's a nice guy all along who loves everyone. Surprise! Amazo was actually a good guy while El Sidney was the evil monster the whole all time. No shit, Sherlock. The good magician gets his magic kit back where he notices that the hair is gone. He warns Tim to beware of the rascally rabbit because he's really an evil sorcerer who tried using his magic to take over the world. Naturally. The rabbit was actually this dark magician who fought Amazo back in his superhero days until the noble wizard turned El Sidney into his meek bunny, who Amazo held onto as a pet so he would never escape and reclaim his power. Until now. When the script demanded it. So, remember that scene from earlier where Tim heard whom he thought was Amazo insulting him? Well, the real Amazo never did that. You know how many kids would give their right arm to be in my show? Now get out of here, you little brat. What happened to you? Where did you go? Well, I waited, and then you told me to beat it, remember? I did. I never said that. It was actually the evil bunny magically impersonating Amazo's voice to trick Tim the whole time. Which makes absolutely no sense because the rabbit said in his animal form he no longer had any magic power. Great continuity! Amazo is not mean, the rabbit is. Tim was just dumb enough to fall for blatant tricks. I know we had to get the plot hopping somehow, but this really messes with things in the book. Amazo really was a meanie head all along, and there was no demon rabbit prisoner. Yeah, in the book, when Tim tries to save his prick sister, it had a 
dumb, dumb conclusion, but it was far off from what we see here. You see, in the mother of all psychotic plot twists, it turns out that there never was an Amazo. Tim's magic hero was really a talking bunny controlling a human puppet all along. Amazo was the sinister hare who used a human puppet to perform magic shows for years in order to make a living. And the kids realize that Amazo was a jerk who doesn't care about anything or anyone. It was very anticlimactic since Amazo wasn't exactly evil or all-powerful. He was just a loser cynical dick bunny. That's it. In fact, his magic wasn't even permanent. Ginny transformed back into a human girl again because the magic wears off, pretty much leaving no stakes in the conflict whatsoever. Lame. But honestly, I'm a little upset that we never got the bunny using a human puppet idea on film now, since that's so insane that I kind of loved it. I wanted to see the human puppet concept brought to life. But alas, Goosebumps did not have the budget for it. Hell, Sydney is more or less the evil traits of Amazo, mixed with side villain Frank. He's the jerk magician all along, and the show attempts to throw this twist villain curveball at us, but they don't do a good job at that either. This twist villain and twist hero thing could have worked, but not enough time is dedicated to it. L. Sidney is such a prick and obviously evil that no one is surprised that he was a bad bunny. The book version had a demented idea that was so crazy it was funny, while the show version has a clever idea that bombs because of poor execution. If more time was focused on the important parts, then maybe it could have been great. But like an old story, it's just a boring waste of time until the real plot decides to arrive. But alright, the moment we've all been waiting for. L. Sydney's final form, where we see... Honey! I'm home! Wait, who the heck is that? That's not Colin Mockery. Of course not, Cat. Colin already had his cameo. Now it's time to switch out from voice actor to live actor. You mean they didn't bother getting Colin Mockery back to play the human form of L. Sidney? Why? Why would you go to all this effort to get Colin Mockery to voice this diabolical mastermind only to replace him with an entirely different dude in the climax? And why is he dressed like a flamboyantly gay mariachi player? This is retarded. So, the Sydney takes his revenge by using the Star Trek metamorphosis effects to trap Amazo and change him into a rabbit. <laughs> so our hero Tim bails out and tries to save his own skin. What an asshole! But El Sydney says he can't go now because he needs the boy in their show together, since the magician plans to honor his word and make the kid his lovely assistant, which stupid ass Tim agrees to and he stays. <laughs> Yeah, despite being told straight to his face that L. Sidney was a dark magician, despite seeing this psycho torment his hero before his very eyes, despite being lied to, Tim decides to join the deranged lunatic sorcerer as his apprentice. Cuz doesn't this look like a face you can trust? I hereby dub thee dumbest kid hero of the Goosebumps. This is retarded. And we get to our twist ending. L. Sidney has apparently given up on that whole conquering the world thing to instead host parties now. That's where the money is. Where he plans on using his new bunnies, Amazo and Tim, in his deadly showcase. 
Yeah, El Sydney just wants to be famous again, and he straight up plans on killing our heroes. But because this episode's stupid, we end on a dumb note. Don't worry, Tim. I'll think of something. I'll get us out of this. What? And quit show business? <laughs> <laughs> Get it, cat? Is this a funny ending or a dark ending? It's far too grim a conclusion for what was intended to be wacky shenanigans, and it's not very funny either. It's just kind of idiotic. How is Tim going to enjoy fame if he's dead? Yeah, this episode is tonally all over the place and doesn't know what it wants to be. A wacky comedy or a grim be careful what you wish for tale. Now the book ending sucks too, since in the end Tim stupidly trusts Amazo again after his sister is cured. And like in the show, he becomes cursed into a rabbit himself. Implying that Tim is going to possess the human puppet show now and live out his magician dreams in Amazo's rabbit feet. It's terrible, but hey, so is the rest of the book. Some people prefer the TV's take on the ending, but I'm not one of them. I think both endings are awful because it's a terrible plot overall. This just somehow manages to be more moronic because Tim is going to die or possibly be stuck in this animal form forever. Yet he's happy with it? Why? Shut up, Amazo. I wanna die. Rip my brains out, baby. You fucking weirdos. I don't even know how to feel about that. Nor do I get what the writers went for because it's not funny. <laughs> like, was Tim being serious and actually liked being a stage pet? Or was this all just the clever wink to the audience? The child acting is so bad that I can't tell. Oh, and if that wasn't horrendous enough, well, we also get wacky comedy credits. This is retarded. I just love that. Yep, this is the only Goosebumps episode that was awarded alternate comedy credits. Obviously, to complement the barrel of laughs we had throughout this whole misadventure. <laughs> the Goofy credits are a nice feature, but they belong on a much funnier episode than what we got. Better luck in the reboot, guys. So, that was the pinnacle of Goosebumps comedy, Bad Hair Day. More like Bad Fail Nay, cause that was pathetic. Abracadabra, Alakazam, make the fans vomit in the can. This episode sucks. I actually love magic and crazy journeys into a world of wonder, but this episode just fails at it. This should have been an enchanting showcase like something with Zatanna or Doctor Strange, but they never take advantage of all this setup and opt for a sillier style. Just to make it worse, it's not even funny. Sometimes a humorous moment or gag does happen, but the episode is acting like it's a laugh every minute, like on South Park or Drake and Josh, which it's just not. The story has a huge issue with trying to decide whether or not it wants to be a funny cartoon world or the usual unnerving Goosebumps nightmare. It tries to be both, but succeeds in neither. The comedy is hit and miss, the effects are lame, the story is so weak, the twists are predictable, the child acting is so painful, the characters are all unlikable, the writing is poorly thought out, it removes all the freaky ideas from the book, it's not scary, and worst of all, it wastes call and mockery. The most dishonorable crime in history. Now, I will confess that I don't think it's the most awful Goosebumps tale ever, 
It's just disappointing. Magic is so cool, and the idea of Goosebumps toying with it sounds like the stuff dreams are made of. Yet I hate how the show pisses that away to play it as a safe screwball kid com. There are bits which are very intriguing, yet the show never works with them or follows basic plot points to forge it into a generic filler episode. As an adult, I hate it. But as a kitten, all I can say is that it's boring. Even when I was little, I could never finish this episode until now. It was just so lame and so dull, to the point that I would always change the channel to watch Spongebob once the stupid hair popped up. I like Squidward. Some of the jokes in this are so lame that I didn't even know they registered as jokes. You know, that should be my tagline of this entire tale. The jokes were so bad that I didn't know it was a comedy. While not insultingly terrible, Bad Hair Day is just lame. Lame as an adult and lame as a kid. Easily the best part of it was Bowser trolling children. He was gold. But I should never, ever have to say that Bowser was funnier than Colin Mockery. <laughs> What did you think, Scaredy? Oh, uh, I forgot. What? What do you mean you forgot? We just saw it. Yeah, but it's just so forgettable. None of the jokes are so funny that you'd laugh at them for ages. The characters suck. The magic is uninspired. The twists have no zap to them. It's not at all scary. And it doesn't even feel like a Goosebumps narrative. It's merely safe. Standard, child-friendly fluff. There to just make the kitties laugh until Stein moves on to a grimmer fantasy. It offered me nothing too fun or thrilling to remember. The comedy is too lame to amuse. And honestly, it's not even some mindless entertainment to enjoy because it's so long and boring. The folks who worked on this episode didn't care. So why should I? There's just nothing here to awe swashbuckling danger cat like me. Right. This episode is lame, but I guess for kids, they might find it meh. So, we grant the infamous Bad Hair Day a bronze skull. Not the ultimate low of the saga, but just a solid waste of grand ideas and pure imagination. I don't recommend it, since it's not that funny, and the fantasy is not fantastic. Bad Hair Day is simply a worthless magic trick that'll definitely fail to amaze. I'm Catastrophe, and I'm Scaredy Cat. And we wish you all a happy Easter. Now, time to do what this episode should have done and disappear. Let's hear the Irish drinking song about your brand new baby and go. Today, my wife gave birth to a tiny tot. A little bouncing happy boy. It just went splat. Look at him. Cute as he can be. I am so delirious. I might have two or three. No. This beat was unexpected. I didn't plan it all through. I did use a condom. She said it doesn't belong to you. He dresses like a girly. And he dresses in pants. But I'm kicking him out of the house because he cannot dance. Although the baby isn't mine, I take it as my own. I'll raise it as a happy lad and put it in the home. I'll take it out to ball games. I'll show him around the town and I'll stop calling him it and borrow money when he's grown. He's left home now. He's gone. See you later. He's off to university. He works for Perlator. I miss him every day. We write and call by phone. Sometimes he just texts me. We never circumcise his bone. Oh, I